Seth Ferranti went from the suburbs to the FBI's most wanted list. Went on the run, did 21 years in prison on charges of selling LSD and weed all along the East Coast. And in one of the more remarkable post-prison stories, he somehow flipped that conviction into a career that includes being an author, activist, and documentary film director. A man with a rather amazing story. We are pleased to welcome the author of Confessions of a College Kingpin, writer, director, producer, filmmaker, author, and entrepreneur, the very accomplished Seth Ferranti to the Mike Power Show. So thank you for joining me for this interview. Uh, let's get right to it. A lot of media outlets have uh, covered your story. A lot of people receive exorbitant sentences, especially for drugs. Um, what do you think made your story so appealing to the mainstream and indie media? I I think because really I I was a first time nonviolent offender, so um, it it was crazy because even even when I first went in the feds and and I told people I had twenty five years and they looked at me because you know I, I was like twenty two, you know maybe like one eighty five. I looked like a, a college student, you know, and and people were like, they they were like, who did you kill? Who did you murder? You know, because you you got to think. I was right at the beginning of, of the war on drugs, and you know when it first started coming, like 88, 89, it was all you know. I mean, we we all know that they were targeting you know blacks, yeah. you know, from the crack era, yeah. You know, and they were hitting everybody in, in in the head. So, you know, down you know in in the African American community, people knew what was going on, but in the white community, people you know it it wasn't really going out there. So then when they did go out there, you know, and it kind of they hit me, and I got that twenty five. I think it really opened. A lot of people's eyes, you know, and they they were kind of like, you know, like like why why are they doing this? And um, yeah, so I think that's why my, my my case appealed to a lot because, you know, I mean, you, you know, think you think a white guy getting smacked with that kind of time was something that was kind of uh, novel to the to the news media, and that's why they kind of seized upon your story. Yeah, because you know that what we do in society. I mean, there, there's so much like like racism and stereotypes yeah. in society, so they think, oh well. Those people, they deserve that. They're doing this, you know, or the way they look. But then, oh, somebody that, you know, looks like you and, and talks like you and, and moves in your circles, then it happens to me. And they're like, whoa, you know, because a, a lot of times, you know, in, in white society, maybe people think, like, you know, stuff like that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, but, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the, uh, the, law, the laws are racist. You know, I was just kind of like. You know, I think I was in that first push when they kind of went out into the suburbs and got like the weed and the LSD people, mm -hmm. you know, because after after they were doing all the uh, the crack stuff in the inner cities, you know, for three, four years, a lot of people started crying out like this is racist because it was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so then like the DEA and, you know, the government and the U.S. attorney's office, they had to cover their ass. And they had to be like, oh, well, look, we convict white drug dealers, too. Right. Well, let's get into your story so that the people that's watching this right now, and thank you for clicking, um, get an idea of how you ended up with that sentence. So you're from the suburbs, and they call you, you know, after you get out of prison or in the news media. You've been on Vice. Um, I was a teenage felon. You were on that show. Uh, they, they call you somewhat of a kingpin. How would you go from the suburbs to moving weed and LSD all along the East Coast? Yeah, well, basically, um, I grew up in California. I was a military brat, you know, so so I moved I moved around a lot, you know. And then when my dad retired, we ended up in Northern Virginia, which, uh, you know, Northern Virginia, you know, it's 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 outside of Washington D.C. Yeah. and where I was, Fairfax County. Fairfax you County. You know, it's a, a, a lot of money. You know, it's like what they call like a lily white area. You know, at least back then, the late eighties, nineties, mm -hmm. and um. And I was just, you know, I, I was like the, the, the quintessential California kid, you know, and I, I was on the East Coast and, you know, I had I had a lot of connections in California. You know, I, I used to go watch the Grateful Dead, you know, so I had a lot of tech connections on Grateful Dead tour. And when, when I first went out there, it was like at first, like we're going way back, like, you know, ninth grade, you know, like 14, 15. You know, we were always like, even Cali, I could get whatever I wanted, you know, weed, you know, acid, you know, mushrooms. Because, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm like a cannabis and psychedelics dude. That's always been my, uh, you know, kind of M.O., my forte. So when I went out there, like, we're looking for stuff, and we can't find stuff. Or if we do find stuff, it's like garbage or it's like real super expensive. So once I found that out, and I, I found out that a lot of those kids, they were like, you know, trust fund babies or their parents had, a, you know, they had big allowances. They had a lot of money. You know, I, I saw opportunity. I was like, well, look, I can just, I know people in Cali. I can get them to send it here. You know, I can get them to send weed. And you're how LSD. old at this time? 
Like 15. 15. But then you ended up at all of these colleges, right? What, what were some of the colleges you visited? And Oh, like like Radford, Vir- Virginia Tech, you know, uh, University of Kentucky, you know, George, George Mason, you know, all, all, all the colleges, you know, like, like Maryland, you know, kind of in that, in that tri-state area, Maryland, Virginia, you know, Kentucky, even like state, co- like Pennsylvania. So what do you do? You just hit, do you just hit the campus and find out where a party is at or you got to connect on no, campus? No, I mean, I, I went to school. So I went to Robinson High School in Fairfax. It was like a big school, like 4,000 people. And then we had like a sister school called Lake Braddock that wasn't even 10 miles away. They had like 4,000 people. And it's all like rich white kids. So mm-hmm. as I was 15, 16, 17, still in high school, you know, I'm, I'm doing deals with all these people. You know, I'm selling weed, you know, whatever. I'm selling pounds, you know, I'm selling ounces. More like probably retail though at this time, you know, smaller stuff. So then as everybody starts going to college, you know, they, they can't get, you know, the same quality or the same price when they're at college. So they're calling me. They're like, hey, man, can you bring shit up? It's dry. Or, hey, man, we can't get no acid up here. Or, hey, can you bring some mushrooms? So then for me, you know, it was like, it was like a business opportunity, you know, where I would go up there, you know. So that's, that's what happened. I just had access to a lot of people, and they went to all these colleges scattered all around the East Coast. Now, were you, were you college age at that point? You still in high school, but other people that went to college. Yeah, you know, like, you know, like when you're, when, you know, I was always the type of dude, like, when I'm a sophomore, like, I'm, I'm hanging out with seniors. You know, I was just always hanging out with people older than me, you know, sometimes, like, even, you know, five years older than me. Yeah. So I just, you know, I dated older girls. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, that was just a situation. So even though I was younger, I, I looked older and I acted older. So, yeah, that's what I, I would just do and then you know I mean my whole thing was probably like I mean 15 16 17 but it was, it was small you know I was just kind of still you, forming it if you're doing all of these colleges you're moving around you need a network you need a team so how did you begin to build out that team it was all friends that, that from my high school man or I would go up and see them and they might know like the local dude that's doing stuff you know that they're buying weed off so they would introduce me to him and I would just come in as a supplier Mm. But it's all it's all through my high school network. It's all through friends. You know, it's weird. A lot of dudes, almost, you know, pretty much everybody on my case, not everybody, but, you know, the majority of the people on my case, I went to high school with. Mm. We were all high school friends. I mean, we were all like 18, 19, 20 when this case came down in, in, in 91 and, and we got indicted. And so are you sending some of your friends, you're, sending them, you're staying home and sending them different places, or are you traveling with them? No, I would travel. I would travel. You know, I've always been, um, I've always been like a, a, a smuggler. I'm a smuggler, basically. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was a dude. Like, I would go to Texas, pick up 50 pounds, pick up 100 pounds. You know, this is back in the days of the brick pot. You know, I would go down to Florida and pick up weed. You know, Fort Myers was a big weed port back then. You know, I would go to Kentucky and get the homegrown. I would go out to Northern Cali and get the homegrown. You know, like like the outdoor, the domestic, you know. And then, then I would get it, and I, I, I used to drive a circuit, so I would go down 81, I would hit all the colleges, then I would go into Kentucky through the Cumberland Gap, hit the Kentucky colleges, then I would go up into West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia University was a really big market, that's a big party school. Then I would go down in Pennsylvania, I would hit State College, that's Penn State, then Penn State has a whole bunch of satellite campuses, you know, like seven for the, for the freshmen and the sophomores, and a lot of my friends were there, I would hit all those. Then I would come back down through Maryland, you know, hit University of Maryland, I, I would come in, you know, D.C., you know, and they got schools there, and then down, down like George Mason was right there. So I would, I would just do this circle. And you're dropping off pounds? Yeah, I'm dropping off pounds. I'm dropping off sheets of acid, picking up money. And most of my stuff, too, was I wasn't cash. I was front. You know, these are like my friends. These are like dudes I partied with. So really, I was the type of dude I kind of made my friends into drug dealers. Like I would say, okay, well, this dude can handle this. I trust this dude. And I would just front them. You know, sometimes dudes fucked it up, sometimes not. You know, if they fucked it up, then you know what I'm saying? I would Did ask, you find your team was, was actually loyal to you? Nobody really tried to get over on you? Uh, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, for the, for, the, for the most part. You know what I'm saying? You I have mean, a story about somebody that did try to get over on you? I mean, dudes, but but I don't, it wasn't like, I don't think like dudes were like trying to like get over me on purpose. Dudes just like fuck shit up. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, I, I had a lot of dudes fuck shit up. Right. I mean, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're in the drug business, I mean, you know, people can tell stories all day about how much money they're owed because yeah. people fuck shit up. You know, and it's an illegal business, so what are you going to do? I mean, you got a one choice. What are you going to do? You're going to kill them or you just let it slide, you know? And I was never a killer, so yeah. and I was on a criminal organization. So, you know, sometimes you let people work shit off. Sometimes they fuck it up so much you just cut them off. 
And I read somewhere you were making twenty thousand a what a week or a uh, month? probably twenty thousand at my high probably around twenty 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 five thousand a month. But that was only that was only at the end, man. So I, I had like right. I caught my case in uh, you know this, like summer ninety one, like August ninety one. So that nine months from the end of ninety. You know, probably like the fall of '90, like mm-hmm. in into the summer of '91. I had like a, a nice nine month run. Yeah, and we're gonna get into. I don't want to go yeah. there quite yet. But um, let me. Ask, how did you stay so low for so long? You're traveling all over the place. You're in the car, got bricks and everything else. How were you able to stay so low? And so many people knowing about what you're doing as well. Well, my my biggest my biggest defense, you know, because I I was I was cognizant of like. You know, because I didn't carry a gun or nothing, so I was cognizant of, of, you know, being set up or maybe dudes trying to rob me. Maybe not the people that I'm dealing with, but, you know, kids like to brag. Mm-hmm. They say stuff, the wrong people hear it. You know, they try to get, you know, they try to pinpoint, like, my movements or something through somebody else. So I was always cognizant of that. So what I used to do, you know, back then you didn't have cell phones. So I had, like, a 1-800 beeper. Mm. I mean, they had cell phones, but they were like those big. Yeah, the bricks. Yeah, they were like two or three grand. I wasn't gonna buy one of those, mm-hmm. but and it was like it cost a lot of money each month, you know, to, yeah, to yeah. even run it. So, um, I had like the one eight hundred beeper. So I was the type of dude. Like, let's say I'm coming, I'm coming to see my guy in Morgantown, and like you know, they're calling me, they're beeping me, and we got codes, so I know who's. And I, I did all my business. I was calling motherfuckers on pay phones. You know, I just had pay phones all the time, pay phones and beepers. So the kids out there that don't know, there used to be phones outside attached to <laughs> poles, and you would put change in it and actually call people. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah, so, dude, I, I would, li- like, literally have, like, hundreds of dollars of quarters because I, I did all my talking on pay phones. So, you know, let's say dude's beeping me from Morgantown. You know, my guy, and he's like, hey, when you going to be here? He's like, I got your money. He's like, everybody's waiting. It's dry. We don't got shit. And... Maybe I'm like an hour out of Morgantown, mm. but I don't tell him that. I'm like, oh man, I'll probably I'll probably be there, you know, tonight, or I'll be there in like, you know, five hours, or I'll be there in the morning. So I always used a lot of misdirection. Mm. That was kind of like my defense, mm-hmm. you know, from getting robbed or getting set up, or you know, from people, you know, set up by the police or set up by whoever. Right. So misdirection. I was a big misdirection dude. I was the type of dude like I'd say I'm not gonna be there, and then I would just show up. And a lot of these places too. Like, I, I would have, like, a room, you know, because dudes have these party houses, and I might I might chip in on the rent, you know, and, and, and I might have a room. I might have a place. So I had keys mm. to places so I could come in, and, you know, and whoever was there, if they saw me, they saw me. But if they weren't, you know, if they were out partying or doing this or in class or whatever, they didn't see me, and then they'd come home, and I'd be on the couch, you know, taking bong hits. So you're you're moving around in the car up and down the East Coast. Um, what's your soundtrack? What were you listening to at that time? Yeah, I, I used Musically. to I used to listen to a lot of uh, a lot of Grateful Dead. Mm-hmm. You know, like the, the the live tapes. Yeah, yeah. So so and and back then too, like we're talking cassettes. Mm, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. I don't even think CDs were just starting then. So I was still like I had you know I had like the little box in my car with all the cassettes. Yeah. So I listened to a lot of Dead, but um, then too you know I'm pretty. Uh, eclectic in, in my musical taste I like I like everything mm-hmm. you know so I, I would listen to a lot of hip hop mm-hmm. you know like like a lot of NWA like yeah. like 80s 80s yeah. you know east coast hip hop yeah. you know I, I like the hip hop back then because I was more into like the uh, like they call it like almost alternative hip hop yeah, yeah. you know not like today yeah. the, the hip hop's way different back then it was like it was like more spiritual more uh, positive mm-hmm. you know a lot of yeah. a lot, especially the hip hop coming out of the east coast like New York and yeah. stuff yeah yeah, you know what I'm saying. It was it was it was it was more lyrical. Well, now there's a lyrical resurgence going on. It's a lot of street stuff going on in terms of the lyrical resurgence, but it's it's, it's high quality poetry at the same time. Mm. I think when we when we scrunch our face up when we talk about certain rap music, it's the the um, auto tune laden type stuff yeah, we're talking, yeah, 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 and yeah. the mumble rap. They're not really saying nothing. So I, I do sympathize with you on that. And what were you doing with the money? Man, I was I was spending it, bro. I, was spend, I used to spend money like crazy. You know, I I was a dude like let's say. We're out partying, like a group of people, and then, you know, like at the end of the night, you know, a lot of people like to go to Denny's or something. You know, I would take, dude, I would take the whole party. Because, you know, some people like, oh, we don't have money. I was, I'd take like 20 people to Denny's. Mm. You know, and we, we, we'd go on whole court, and I, I would pay cash. You know, so I just did a lot of stuff like that. I did, uh, I think at one time, dude, probably before I got busted, like in 91, dude, I probably had like 
I don't know, I probably had like 150 pair of fucking like high tops, you know, mostly Air Jordans, but mm-hmm. other stuff, mm-hmm. you know, so I used to buy, and I, I was the type of dude too, dude, like, I would buy shirts, like polos, like polos were real back then, mm-hmm. I'd buy polos, dude, I would wear that shit like once, <laughs> take the tag off, you know, I always want to do fresh shit, dude, that's just, you know, I'd give that shit to my, to my boys, to my homies, you know, I'd wear that shit once and I'd be like, Pfft. Yeah, you, what, what type of car? I always I had Subarus, man. So I had because I was a smuggler, bro. So, you know, back back then they they had those Subaru four wheel drive turbo station wagons. Yeah. And like on the on the side it said like four wheel drive turbo. Yeah. Yeah. So I had three of those. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, and you and had... I would switch them, and I would switch them. Oh, okay. All right. So people never knew, but they were all they were all those same Subarus. Yeah. You had a good warranty on the Subarus and everything like. That? Yeah, I, I guess. I, mean, I, I used to put a lot of miles, man. I used to put a lot of miles. But I, I would switch them out, you know, so I, I would always have, like, a different color car and stuff. Okay, so at, at a certain point, and we know this is a, a big part of your story, you went on the run, and you faked your own death. Okay, what precipitated you having to go on the run in the first place? Well, because I got busted. They were trying to give me 20 to life. Oh, so you had gotten arrested. What, you got out on bond? Yeah, yeah, I was out on bond. And then you yeah. just took off from there. Yeah, yeah, I took off. Okay, and when did you get the idea that I'm going to fake my own death? Well, I was, I was always been a big sports fan, right? So, you know, I, I was in Northern Virginia, so, like, our paper is the Washington Post. And so, you know, I would always get the newspaper every day. Boom, I go right to the sports section. Right before the sports section is the metro section. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, you know, I, I would read, like, the metro headlines, you know, for a second. Something might catch my eye. And people were always committing suicide at this national park called Great Falls. Cause right, they, they got, it's, it's a, the Potomac River goes through Great Falls and it's like, uh, there's like some areas where it's like class five rapids, you know, and it's, it's like all different like rocks and really, and, and people would jump in there because if you don't get, you either you're gonna get smashed against the rocks or you're gonna drown cause mm. you can't swim. Yeah. So I, I remembered like when this case came about and I was looking for an escape route because you know, when, when I caught that Fed case, dude, I, I had a couple options, right? Go to trial, which, you know, not very many people go to trial against the feds. They got like a 99.5 conviction rate, right? Plead guilty, you know, or, or cooperate. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't want to face trial because, you know, I, I, who knows how much I would have got 20 to life. You know, um, I didn't want to cooperate, you know. So really the, the only other option, you know, I had, I, I could take that, take that 20-year plea and then, you know, take off. So once I decided, you know, I was going to do that course of action, I was like, how can I make Seth Ferrante disappear? Because I was like, if Seth Ferrante is gone for seven years, you know, I can be declared legally dead. So then if there's no Seth Ferrante, if Seth Ferrante is declared legally dead, there's no case. So I came up with this plan. I'm like, I'm going to fake my suicide, and then I'm going to live under some different name, and then in seven years, my parents can have me declared legally dead, and then, you know, there's no case no more. Then I can be whoever. You know, I can be whoever I am. So that was kind of my escape plan so I made this plan I staged my suicide I set it up I put a uh, you know like a, a suicide note I put my car there and I started hinting to different people you know that I was distraught because of the case and mm-hmm. I didn't know if I could make it you know I didn't want to cooperate against my friends and that was the only way I wouldn't go to jail um, and then I went and I, I, I staged my suicide and um, it was it was when I first did it, you know, I, I went right out to L.A. And I stayed with some people I knew in L.A. And um, I was going down every day. And, you know, back then on the corners, they had, like, the big newsstands with all the papers from all the big cities. So I was, like, right in Hollywood. And I would go to this newsstand every day. And I was looking, you know, for the metro section in the Washington Post. So the first the first headline after that, I saw it said, uh, you know, Fairfax LSD key kingpin commits suicide. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I fucking got these motherfuckers. My plan worked, you know? So I was like, I was like feeling like I was on one million, you know, like, I'm, like I'm only 20, dude. I'm like, I'm like 20 and I'm like, man, I fucking tricked these motherfuckers, right? But then like two weeks, I kept reading the papers cause it was talking about, you know, the trial on my co-defendants and shit like that. And then like two weeks later, I, I saw the headline and it was like, it was like, uh, you know, prosecutors uh, call suicide a hoax. Right, and I was like, "Fuck!" I was like, "Well, you know, I was like crushed, man. I was like, you know, all this planning I did, and now they're saying it's a hoax." So I started reading it, and then I found out why. I started reading it because um, I staged my suicide on the wrong side of the dam, you know. So the Potomac River goes out to the Atlantic Ocean. That's what I thought my body mm. would, you know. Right. 
wash out to the Atlantic Ocean. They can never find me. But there's there's these dams, you know, to calm the water down because they got all these bridges going into D.C. You know, so I, I staged a suicide on the wrong side of the dam. So the U.S. Park Rangers said they dragged the river for two weeks and they didn't find a body. And they said they always find bodies in this spot if you go in right there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was in my... Uh, in my fucked up, you know, whatever, young mind, you know, thought I was super smart, but really, I saved my suicide on the wrong fucking side of the dam. And like you, um, you, 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 had, you had parents. Did you, did your parents know that you had faked your own death? Yeah, yeah, I told my mom. I told my mom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she, they knew the whole time. Yeah, I told okay. my mom, yeah. <laughs> um, You know, but only a couple of people know, like my mom and the person who drove me. All right, so take me to the moment where you actually get discovered by authorities again. How did you get caught? Well, eventually I, I made my way back to Texas, you know, because I, I had a lot of uh, weed contacts in Texas, you know, like, like Mexicans in Dallas. So, um, you know, and I had a little money when I took off, you know, not that much, maybe fucking 20, 30 grand. But I was in L.A., I blew through that shit, you know, because I, I, was, I, was, I was a drug dealer. I made a lot of money, so I was used to spending a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't make that adjustment when I went out to L.A., and I kept spending a lot of money. In like six months, I blew like fucking 30 grand. You know, just out there fucking hanging out with people, you know, whatever, and not having any money coming in. So then I went back to Texas. I hooked up with my, my, my pot dealer down there, and um, I was selling weed down in Texas. But, you know, at this time, it's mostly brick pot in Texas, and, um, you know, you could get pounds down there for like three, $400 of that brick weed. You know, I, it, it's just weed was so plentiful down there, I wasn't making any money. You know, I was like barely making it. So... Um, you know, but I was I was selling weed to like a lot of the restaurant crowd, and so I, I met this one dude. He was a cook at a restaurant, and he used to kind of hustle for me a little bit down there. And then he was from St. Louis, so one time he was like, "Yo, I'm gonna go up to St. Louis." He goes, "You want to bring some weed?" He goes, "We could probably sell it for a lot more money up there." So like we jumped in his truck. I got like 20 pounds, and and, and we went up there. And this was really like my my second like little run. You know where I made some decent money, mm-hmm. so I had an- another like little maybe you know maybe about a year, and it also was a time too because like when all that shit happens to you, dude, especially when they're that young, and like they just rip everything from you, you know what I'm saying? I, w- I was like at a low point in my life, you know, all this shit happened to me, you know, I-, I just felt like shit, like I made a lot of mistakes, I fucked up, whatever, and um, and then going up there and started making money, I, I started getting like my moxie back, you know, I started getting my swag back. Mm-hmm. And um, so, like, I'm rolling again, even though, you know, I'm not Seth. I'm, like, I'm like got fake IDs. Everybody calls me Christopher Haas. So I'm rolling up there, and then, uh, yeah, eventually, you know, just, I mean, I'm doing this at the height of the war on drugs. You know, we're talking, like, you know, I was a fugitive from 91 to 93. My case was from 91. This is, like, you know, the height of the war on drugs. You know, like, we're still, like, the first five, ten years of the war on drugs. This started in the late 80s. So... You know, in retrospect, it was pretty stupid. Like, I thought I'm going to keep selling drugs while I'm a fucking fugitive at the height of the war on drugs. You know, in retrospect, yeah. it was pretty stupid. You know, but when you're young and dumb, you know, you think you're super smart. You know, you do bold, reckless shit. So eventually, I got caught. I got arrested under a fake name. Um, they matched my prints, but they, they released me. They released me, right? But they matched my prints. But it took, like, three or four days for my prints to match up. And then they went and... uh you know, they started, I was fake name, but, you know, the dude I got arrested with, it was his real name. It was the same cook, you know, that I, I brought up, you know, that was from St. Louis. And he started taking the feds around, the U.S. Marshals, to all the houses with people I did was doing business with because he introduced me to them all. And, um, yeah, eventually that's how, that's how they caught me. You know, they, they had somebody, you know, they caught him, and I just talked to him to bring him some weed, and they were, you know, waiting for me. They got me. Do you, you know, think you, 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 you took a plea? It was a Fed case. Yeah. Do you think you got more time because you went on the run? No, I did. I got five more years because I went on the run. Okay. I, I got, I got a fucking, I got it. Look, I got obstruction of justice, right? That was like a fucking enhancement. My my base was like like twenty years, you know, twenty year mandatory minimum. So I got obstruction of justice, you know, because I took off, and then I got a failure to appear too. So I got I got like five extra years for running. How do you get your mind? to a place that you could stand in front of a judge, plead guilty, knowing that you're accepting 21 years or 25 years. Well, I mean, at the time, I didn't think that because I was just pleading guilty so I could fucking get out and take the fuck off. You didn't know you was about to get football numbers? 
I knew, but I thought I was smart enough to take off and, and they would never find me. Bro. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So this is uh, – well, I'm trying to figure this out. You get convicted and then you're – No, I pled guilty. I was never sentenced. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cause, so they didn't remand you immediately? No, 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 no. Wow, because I know yeah. if it's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that racism, bro. Yeah. So, so look, so look, I was a white kid from a good family from a rich area. And they, they probably, because of dudes like me running, they, they're not letting dudes like me out anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, but this is right at the beginning, bro. Yeah. So, you know, they were still like, you know, and plus – they wanted me to cooperate, bro. So they were like, you yeah. know, dude, like my own lawyers, like back then of the feds, like even your lawyers are trying to fucking sell you out. So that's the whole time, you know, my lawyers are saying cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But I'm like, man, I'm like fucking, I'm like, well, whatever, we'll see. But, but the I'm whole time to... in my mind, I'm, I'm just making my escape plan. So they want your plug. Yeah, they want me to bring people, they want me to set people up. That's how the feds do. Yeah, you know? yeah. Feds climb up motherfuckers like a ladder. Yeah. Um... Uh, just switching lanes just a little bit. It's a lot going on with the, you might have heard about this, Young Thug, the YSL Rico case. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of his partners, Gunner, free, said he didn't snitch. you have any thoughts about that whole affair? Um, not- well, I mean, the, the paperwork doesn't lie. Look, in prison, mm-hmm. you can't say nobody's a snitch, bro, unless you got paperwork. Right? Mm-hmm. In the streets, motherfuckers can say anything. Mm-hmm. They can say anything, bro. It's speculation, gossip. So I'm saying, in, unless you can't say nobody's a snitch unless you got the paperwork, man. Mm-hmm. But you know, in prison, if you put a bone on someone like you're a snitch, and there you don't got the paperwork, you're yeah. gonna get hit. Yeah, yeah. But on the street, motherfuckers can say whatever they want on the street, bro. And see, I don't know a lot about the inner workings of this particular case, but when you get brought in on a RICO, a whole group of people, especially all black people. Yeah, yeah. One of those guys is looking at football numbers, but all of a sudden he's free. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? He's saying he didn't stitch. I don't know what he did, right? But yeah, but the paperwork doesn't lie. Right, right. So like I say, if there's paperwork, it's eventually going to come out. If these, his co defense have a trial and he testifies, that's paperwork. Everybody's going to know. That's in the court transcript. Mm-hmm. You can't hide that. Mm-hmm. That's public record. Yeah. So um, li- like I say, I mean, you know, you could say it's questionable, yeah. But until the motherfucker's on the stand or until he's setting up, right. you know what I'm saying? Because, look, dude, you ain't, you're ain't you not going to be on no Fed case and, and you're going to work it off as a confidential informant. You're going to have to testify, bro. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You're going to have to testify. And if you are a CI, you know, it's, it's going to come out in, in, in someone's case. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they protect their CIs, but... You know, so I always say, I, I always say, like, you know, the paperwork doesn't lie. That's black and white, you know, until you, you get to that stage. But, you know, the, the, the feds, too, man, the feds do all types of stuff. I mean, they hide people in witness protection program. You know, they protect people. If somebody's working for them, you know, like, they'll protect him forever and, and, and hide him. And he might not even get his case settled for, like, four or five years because he's working for him. So, you know, who knows if it's something like that. But, you know, until until you got the paperwork. I mean, you can't really say. I mean, you can suspect. I know in some prison systems, uh, like maybe in the Midwest, people go to prison, you got to make meals out of commissary, right? And uh, like in Ohio, they might call them breaks, right? What do they call them in California? Oh, spreads? Well I, was, well, I was locked up. You was where? I was locked up on the East Coast, yeah, but they call them spreads. Yeah. They call, is it, that's what they spreads, call them on the East Coast. Spreads, they call them spreads. Yeah, spreads. What was one of your favorites? Oh, shit. Like a nacho box? Nacho box. Yeah, so we, we, would, get, we would get like a box, you know, like a... Uh, you know, you get a box and they like like cut it down so it's just basically like a tray. Mm-hmm. You know, then we put some like some plastic down, and then we put some chips, and then we mix the chips too. We put like some Doritos and some fucking Tostitos, whatever we get from the commissary, mm-hmm. and then summer sausage. You know, uh, cheese. You know, if we if you get it from the kitchen, you know, get some like tomatoes, green peppers, onions. You know, like some refried beans, and then basically you would cook all that shit in the microwave and then just pour it over the chips. You know, and it would just be like a like a trade with nachos, yeah. So And who was putting money on your books? Oh, my parents, yeah. My parents, okay, so they looked yeah, out for yeah, you. Yeah, my parents looked That's out dope. Me. So you didn't have to really rely on the, the what was going on in the chow hall. No, no, no. I dude, I had like uh I had like I had like dudes would bring me shit from the kid. I had like dudes on retainers, you know. I, I would send dudes like a hundred, two hundred bucks a month to bring me shit. You That's know, the I, other thing. You you you're a hustler. You a new a natural born hustler. You get into the joint, everybody needs a hustle. So what was yeah, your hustle yeah, yeah, inside? Yeah. 
Well, I, I started, when I first got in there, I started working in um, like recreation because I, I was always a big sport dude. I played tons of sports. I was like the white dude out there running full court with the black dudes. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. sometimes the only one. Yeah. Right. And I, I I played all soccer with the Mexicans, you're in Jamaicans and stuff like that, Colombians, you know, and then uh so I was a big sports. So I worked in recreation and um at first I was my job was like I was keeping the stats. Mm. You know, I was like the statistician for yeah. like the softball games, the basketball games, whatever. And then I would do the stats and I would put up the stats. I would compile the stats and I would post them up on the board so you could see who's the batting leaders, you know, high rebound leaders, stuff like that. And then some dudes that had been in longer than me, they kept coming up to me, right? And they would be like, uh, they will be like, dude, like, uh, why don't you do like a, a newsletter, a newspaper? Mm. And I'd be like, what do you mean? And they would show me, you know, like some from the, you know, like from Terry Hutt or some different places they were at in Atlanta. And it was just like little write-ups. So then I started doing, I started doing these little write-ups, right? Like kind of like little sports newsletters. So once I started doing that, I got we're in prison, like I would get a higher grade. You know, I got where, like in prison they pay you like grade five is maybe like 525 a month. And then like grade one, you can maybe make like a hundred bucks a month. So first I got myself up to like a grade one, just writing these newsletters. So I was getting paid like a hundred bucks a month. So so that was like how I made money. But then another way, um, I was taking college classes when I went in there, right? In college classes, so I was always in the uh, law library typing mm-hmm. up my college papers. And so dudes, you know, I know all these dudes from playing sports, like black, Spanish, whatever, white. So dudes would always see there, and, like, when you file any type of administrative remedy in there, you know, any type of grievance against the institution, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, like, this is not legal work to the court. This is, like, legal work, like, in the joint. So you get it has to be typed up. You can't write it. Like, they give you these little forms, and you got to – so dudes would see me typing, and they know me, so they'd be like, yo, can you type this up for me? So I started doing it for free for people at first, but then I started seeing like, like the, they'd be filing and they, the way they're arguing. I'm like, dude, this this is like bullshit, dude. I'm like, you got to readjust your argument. You ain't gonna win shit with this. So then I got where I would start looking up policy, mm. you know, and, and regulations. And so then you know I started I started doing it, and and within a couple years, like I got so good that I got a reputation. So then like everybody was coming to me because I was getting people good time back. I was getting people's visits back. I was getting people their commissary and and, and phone, you know, privileges. Your back. hustle was actually helping your fellow inmate. Yeah. And then, then so then I got to the point, dude, where like, if you want to talk to me about something, you got to bring three books of stamps. You know what I'm saying? Because cause I want a whole bunch of people shit, get their shit back. You know, or got people transferred or got people in different programs. You know, so I got really good at that. So, um, yeah, so I, I so I was in the law library, not like a jailhouse lawyer because I'm not doing outside cases, but for stuff inside. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was really, you know, my, my kind of first hustle. You know, and I brought in here and there. I would bring in a little weed every now and then, you know, like through the visiting room. You know, I did that a little, but mostly to smoke, mm-hmm. you know, because I've always been a stoner. But then eventually from that writing stuff, you know, writing the newsletters and then writing like the the legal type work and then I kept taking college courses and it was all like writing heavy courses um because I was doing correspondence courses then I started writing articles first my the big thing I first started writing I was writing like about prison life I was writing about prison basketball and I started uh I started trying to get published like by outside sources you know and 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 I started like I started writing for these different magazines I started and then eventually I started writing like gangster stories like Mm. of dudes I was locked up with so I started writing for Vice I had a column for Vice by the end of the 90s I had a column for Vice called I'm Busted while you're still incarcerated yeah called I'm Busted where I would just write like about prison life you know I was doing uh like interviews gangster stories you know about street legends you know for like Don Devin feds Mm -hmm. and I was doing prison basketball stuff for this website called Hoops Hype which is now like part of USA Today or something. So you know. when you write when when you write for something like Don Diva, because I, I, I know there's you know a lot of people have been incarcerated. They may not know which steps to take to get to the place where you got to. What were the exact steps? Let's say specifically with a place like Don Diva. How did you reach well, out to them? This is what I did. Um, another thing in prison, like mail mail call is like huge in prison, bro. Mm-hmm. So mail call every day after the four o'clock count. So, you know, my, my, my parents are middle class, upper middle class. So I had like 30 magazines. I used to get the, like the newspapers and I had like 30 magazine subscriptions. So when I started writing, what I would do, you know, this was still like the print magazines. I would open and I would go to like the masthead, 
you know, where it has like the editor, all the people that work mm -hmm. there. And you could do this online too. You know, they got mass heads online. You just find who the people that work there, the who the editors are, mm -hmm. who, who decides what is printed. So I would read that. And I would never go for like the editor in chief. I would go down and try to find like an associate editor. Mm. You know, someone that might have the time to read what I'm saying. And then I would write them letters, dude, like snail mail. Mm. So that's how I started my whole writing career. I would say, oh, you know, I see the magazines. Like I didn't know Don Diva magazine. Some other dudes had dudes from New York had it, you know, and I saw it laying around and I looked at it. And I was like, hey, you know, I got the idea. You know, hey, I can write, I can write for these dudes. You know, I can, I'm locked up with these dudes. You know, I can interview, I can pitch, I can interview these dudes. So that's what I did. I wrote to him and I said, hey, you know, so-and-so's on the compound with me. You know, you want me to ask him if he wants to do an interview for your magazine? Mm. And, then, and so that's how I, like, literally, when I was in prison, dude, motherfuckers thought I was crazy because I would have, like, a stack of fucking envelopes and letters to mail out. And it's all, like, query letters, bro. It's all query letters mm -hmm. trying to get myself... You know, like 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 pitching articles. Yeah. So and I and dudes would, dudes would see me walk and I dude I would have like a hundred envelopes. And dudes would be like, "What the fuck, dude? Or like you're fucking insane!" Like the guards and the prisoners. But that's what I was doing, dude. I dude I probably sent out ten thousand fucking letters, if not more. And that's a I think that's a valuable lesson. Let me just I just want to not to cut you off, but Jordan talks about this or talked about this back in the day. Is that how he he was getting so good? in the off season. And he would say, you know, when all of my teammates, all these other players, they out in the club, they're kicking and everything, I'm in the gym, you know what I mean? And so people looking at you like you're crazy. The 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 convicts, the COs, you got, got this, he's crazy, right? But it's that thing, right? It's that thing that nobody else is doing, right? Because if it was easy, everybody be doing it. Mm -hmm. But it's that thing that made you stand out and it's the thing that brought you that, what we, turn out to be your ultimate success. I mean, you in the joint, right? You're reading Don Diva with your byline inside the joint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have been, that must have gave you some sort of. Oh, dude, no, it, it, it was tremendous, man. Just like, just like the self-worth. Cause I mean, when, when you go to prison, okay, boom, I'm a drug dealer, I'm a drug king, man, I'm whatever. You know, I mean, I, I think of myself more as an activist these days or, you know, outlaw. I always tell people I was never a criminal. I was an outlaw. I broke laws that I thought were wrong. You know, I was an activist. I believe in, in cannabis and LSD that people should have it. But, you know, then when when you're in there, like, they strip that all away from you. Like, you go in the feds, bro. Like, it don't matter how much money you have. You Everybody's wearing khakis. It doesn't matter who the fuck you are. Everybody got gray sweats. You know, it doesn't matter if you're fucking caked up. Everybody got the same fucking shoes that they sell on commissary. Right, so they strip all that away from you, you know? And then, and then like, you have all these, you know, like, opinions or, you know, self-images, and, and they just, like, take that away. Like, you're not that anymore, you know? So then, like, I had to reinvent myself. Like, who the fuck am I? Like, what am I about? You know, yeah, I thought I was this dude. I thought I was this fucking counterculture outlaw activist, but they fucking gave me 25 years and fucking threw me in here and took all that away from me. So I had to do like a lot of self-examination and, and, and reinvent myself. And even though I, you know, I still am that guy today. I'm that outlaw, you know, counterculture activist. But you know, I, I had to question because those actions led to me getting 25 years. And even though I, I still believe it was wrong and I never should have had to do 25 years, that's what happened. So you know, you got to question yourself. Like, was I misguided? You know, was I right? Do I got to go a different direction? So I turned to education in prison. I turned to writing. You know, I stayed out of the drama. I didn't join no gangs. I didn't have no, you know, geographical affiliations. I wasn't like in there, like in the mix. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't get involved in the prison politics. You know, I played sports, I worked out, and I stayed in the law library. Staying out the way is what they call yeah. it. Yeah. And um, besides being arrested, what was the most tense, filled day you had when you were hustling, if you could remember that? I'd say we'll, we'll probably, you know, I, I had this girlfriend. I had this girlfriend. That, dude, I was in love. She was older than me. I was in love. I actually stole her from this uh, bigger weed, weed dealer, right? And uh, she was, like, like probably, like, five years older than me, dude. Like, I'm, like, 19. She's probably, like, 24. And she's, like, the uh, – she's, like, like if you think of, like, the, the classic beautiful hippie chick, like, that's who this girl was, right? And um, love this fucking girl, dude. And, uh, you know, right before I got busted, kind of at the end, as our relationship deteriorated, she got – she got um, addicted to heroin, mm. actually through through one of my co-defendants, you know, 
one of my co-defendants, you know, she was she she actually brought it to me one time, and she had got some heroin from one of my co-defendants, and because he was he was like a heroin addict, and she wanted me to smoke it with her. And I'm like, man, I knew my friend. I'm like, I'm not I'm not doing that shit. Look at this fucking dude. I'm not like I'm not doing no fucking heroin. Like, oh, you got me fucked up. But she want to try it, so I'm like, I won't ever try it. So she went from that straight to banging out needles. And um, yeah, I remember that. That was like a, that was like a heartbreak. That was like a real tense situation. So it was like I had that fucking breakup because I basically told her I'm like, it's the fucking heroin or it's me. Mm. And she chose the fucking heroin, dude. And and she's fucking. I'm still in contact with her today, but uh, she went, dude. She was like fucked up. Like she's clean now, but dude, she had like a like a thirty thirty five year fucking battle with heroin mm. that started right then. Mm. And that was like the. Uh, that was like the fucking like I was distraught like I was like suicidal I was like heartbreak so I had that and then right after that like I caught my case dude it was like fucking crazy <laughs> well what was the biggest difference with the outside world um, when you reemerged because you did 21 years right yeah so I went in 93 came out 2015 what you notice what was the biggest difference that you noticed when you the phones man the phones, the phones yeah. yeah the phones bro the f- like you know it, it was weird because you know when it, when I was in prison the last two years, all I did was read books. Like, I studied them, like, religiously, like textbooks, right? I got all those books, like, uh, you know, like the Dummy's Guide to the Internet, you mm-hmm. know, the the Idiot's Guide to iPhones, you know. And I was reading, I, I had, like, 10, 15 of these books because mm-hmm. I wanted to understand. Like, I didn't, know, I didn't know about this. And plus, I knew I wanted to, you know, I was already a writer, but I knew I wanted to move into film. I wanted to move into more visual shit. So I was reading all these books. And, um... One of the biggest things, like when I got out, it took me, dude, probably took me like nine months to kind of comprehend was um, like how people say, like like bandwidth. You know, because mm-hmm. like when I was thinking of bandwidth, I'm thinking like like shortwave radio or something. You know, I'm, I'm from the fucking 80s, bro. Yeah. Like they're talking about bandwidth. I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? Shortwave fucking radio. So I didn't understand that concept, how yeah. people were using it. And the other thing I didn't understand, I didn't understand the difference between cellular and Wi-Fi, mm. dude, it took me like nine months, right? And I'd be like, well, you know, you got the phone. If it's on, you don't care. I can fucking do stuff on cellular Wi-Fi, but, you know, because I didn't understand that bandwidth. So, you know, I didn't, and, and as I got out and started working as a journalist, and, you know, I'm, I'm handling, like, these high-res images for the articles, and, you know, I'm trying to download them on my phone on, like, cellular, and the fucking shit ain't working. And I'm yep. like, what the fuck? And then, you know, you got to go on Wi-Fi. You got to have more bandwidth. And I'm telling you, that concept, it, it was, like, easily, like, six to nine months before I fully understood that concept mm. of bandwidth and, and what the difference was between cellular and Wi-Fi. And then, so eventually you get into filmmaking, right? And I don't know if I'm jumping ahead or whatever, but you were involved in a documentary called White Boy about uh, Rick Wershing, called him White Boy Rick. They made a feature film about it. Matthew McConaughey was in that movie, a big time movie. But this was a documentary that told the actual real life story of this Rick Wershing who's from Detroit that if I'm not mistaken, uh, fell in with these brothers out there, some black guys out there. And he ended up being fingered as what the, what the boys thought he was the kingpin essentially, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So how did you get around to kind of being able to tell this story and get it to film? Well, you know, I, I started like the late '90s writing for like Don Devin Fed, so I started writing the gangster stories, yeah. and then um, eventually I, I had compiled so much material, you know, because I did the magazines, but magazines are like limited in space for like pictures. So, so the dudes would hit me up; they'd be like, "Oh, we gave you all those pictures. Why do you only use like four? Mm. Four? What are you gonna do with it? Oh, you, there's more to the story. Why didn't you put it? You know, because I'm writing like whatever. I'm writing like four thousand word pieces." You know, for for the magazines, like features are only like maybe four thousand words. So I had all this, I had accumulated all this extra material, and so then you know, like around two thousand five, I decided I want to start putting books. So that's when I I formed Guerrilla Convict from inside, and I put out my first book, Prison Stories, and then Street Legends Volume One. And so, you know, I'm I'm doing all this stuff, and and I I'll admit when I first started writing, I was. Uh, I was kind of taking, because this was like gangster rap too, like the mid 90s, you yeah. know, kind of yeah. opened up all these doors where, where people would talk about this stuff. Because, you know, a, a lot of stuff, you know, from the inner cities or the hood, you know, people didn't talk about it. Because if you talked about it, you know, stuff that happened in the street or a prison, you were a snitch. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be in a stitch. But then, you know, gangster rap comes along and they're all rapping, and, you know, about all this stuff. You know, like all the, you know, 50 Cent and Nas about the hood legends, mm-hmm. the street legends, the people they grew up, you know, admiring. 
And I was locked up with these dudes, you know. So that's when, you know, I was like, man, I was like, I can, I can start doing this. And I started putting out the books. And um, once I start putting out the books, you know, it's just uh, then people are like almost bringing me stories. And when I first heard about Rick, I was in Beckley, West Virginia, like '96 to '99. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and, and and like I said, I haven't even written. I'm just formulating these ideas in this mind. Like '96 to '99, I'm still like formulating. Like I want to be a writer. I didn't really start writing until the end of the '90s and into the 2000s. My first book didn't come out till 2005. But I'm forming all this plan in my mind, right? And I hear I hear about this dude Rick because in Beckley, West Virginia, there's a lot of dudes from Detroit were there. Mm-hmm. And you know, and like I said, I was a white dude that I would be the white dude like in the black TV room. Mm-hmm. You know, like one of the only white boys that can even go, because I play ball with everybody. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And like, I wasn't no superstar, but I was good. Right. So, you know, they respected me. You got to invite it to the cookout. Yeah. So I would be in there, and and, um, and they're talking about this dude, white boy Rick. You know, like, we're watching the raps, and we're talking about, you know, everything. And, and like, dude, when you're in there, like, you hear, like, the real street stories. Like, you hear the stuff, you know, you're not going to hear nowhere else. Mm-hmm. Like, you hear who got murdered and why and everything like that. Yeah. You know, like, stuff I wouldn't even put in a publication because I'm not trying to give anybody a case. Mm-hmm. But I started hearing about this dude, and, and I felt a lot of similarities with him because, you know, he was, a, he was a white dude, you know, that was in an African-American community, you know, on the street, you know, and, and got a lot of time at a young age. And, and I was a white dude that got a lot of time, and, you know, I, I hung out with a lot of black dudes in prison. So, you know, we had these similarities. So, um, But at that time, he was still in witness protection program, and... and um, I wanted to write about him, but I couldn't. I couldn't find him because mm. he was in witness protection program. So, but I kept that in the back. I kind of filed it in the back of my mind. I was like, man, I want to fucking talk to this dude. I want to interview him. You know, I want to write about him. And um, then, like around two thousand five, I was I was working on this Fat Cat book. You know about Fat Cat, mm-hmm. Pappy Mason, and um, I was reading Fat Cat had caught this uh, like car theft ring charge, like from prison in the witness protection program. And one of the people on the case was white boy Rick. And I read it said they both got kicked out of the witness protection program and sent back to like their states. So Fat Cat obviously got back sent back to the New York system. Rick got sent back to Detroit, mm-hmm. you know, or to the Michigan system. Mm-hmm. So then now I can find him because now, you know, he's not in witness protection. So I started writing him. And even when Rick first started writing me, dude, because I was still at this point, I'm still doing like the, 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 uh, you know, the wild, wild west, you know, like I'm romanticizing all this gangster stuff, you know, mm-hmm. I'm glamorizing it, you know, I'm, I'm making everybody out to be like, you know, Billy the Kid, mm-hmm. Jesse James, you know, yeah. that was kind of my thing because I was writing for my audience. My audience was the people in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people in the outside world liked it, but I was writing for my peers, mm-hmm. you know. I live in here. I live inside the belly of the beast. These are my peers, so this is, who, this is my audience. So first, Rick started writing me, man, and like, the stuff he was telling me, it just, it just wasn't, you know, I want to romanticize him. I want to make him into this Billy the Kid type figure. And he's telling me about, like, all this injustice and, you know, and and working for the cops and being an informant and, and you know, even at a young age. But at first, I'm like, whoa, you know, you're like, you're in prison. You don't want nothing. To, I, don't, I don't fuck with no snitches. Right, right. You know, I'm not trying to get Brandon snitch. You right. know, it's like, you know, so... It took me a while, but I, I was still writing him because I was always trying to convince him, like, I want to write about you like this. But he's like, no, I want to get out of prison. You got to write about me like this. He goes, this is bullshit. Mm. He goes, I got fucked over. You know, so. And then, so people but, that don't know, he was an informant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but, you know, he basically got pimped out by the cops when he was like 15, bro. Mm. So, you know, as I got older and I started seeing like the injustices of the drug war, you know, um, and I guess as I matured, my writing changed. So I went from, like, glamorizing, you know, these guys in, in a lot of my early work to I went to more writing about, like, the victims of the drug war and the, the racial injustice and, and the vindictive prosecution and, and targeting African Americans and, and other minorities, you know, and the corruptness of the DEA and the drug war. So my writing changed. Peeling back the layers now. Where, where I'm, like, exposing stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. So then at first I didn't know how to write about Rick's case. But then, you know, as I got older, you know, we're moving in into like, you know, 2010s, you know, I so then I started writing a series of articles, you know, about where, uh, 
you know, basically telling his story. And, you know, I write for Vice and these other websites and a couple of them, like, they went viral and, and ignited a lot of interest. And he's had interest in his case at different times, but, you know, sometimes there will be a lot of interest in his case. It goes away. He's buried in prison, you know, and the interest comes back. So I started writing all these articles, and I developed a rapport with him. You know, and I, I was actively, I was writing to try to get him out of prison. Because mm. I was like, how's this dude? He got, like, he was, like, he was like an informant, and he only got busted with eight k- k- kilos of cocaine, and he got life. And to be sh- and to be clear, the people who he used to rock with, the black people he used to rock with, they were advocates of him getting out. Yeah, they yeah, thought yeah, that yeah. he got way too much time yeah. for his involvement. Yeah. yeah, you know. So and and then like his whole case, like it it's a lot of political corruption in his case. You know, in his case, you know, goes all the way up to you know Mayor Coleman Young, the longtime mayor who was of, in the movie of Detroit. Yeah. With a, what was the movie? Forty Eight Hours. Was yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. Um, with Eddie Murphy. Oh yeah. Oh no, that was a uh, Gil. That's Gil Hill. Okay. That was that was the the one of the lead uh, homicide uh, homicide investigators. Yeah, he, he worked was, under Mayor Coleman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gil Hill. Uh huh. But um, yeah. So I I, I just start my writing changed, you know, as I matured and, and 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 as I got older and um, yeah, and then eventually, you know, I I, I got out. 2015 and and I was working as a journalist you know a national true crime journalist for vice and you know writing about prison issues and you know sentencing disparity like you know the, the crack cocaine disparity which was like a hundred to one at the time yeah and um I was just writing about the disproportionate sentences and, and and you know all this uh you know racial injustice you know and writing about my case too because even my case i was like a first time nonviolent offender bro and i got 25 fucking years for mm-hmm. selling fucking weed and lsd which weed is now fucking legal and they're looking at lsd you know and psychedelics for all types of stuff so you know i felt i felt persecuted against so i could see how all these you know especially people of color were they were getting persecuted you know way worse than me mm-hmm. you know i mean dudes in there for like you know Five thousand dollars worth of rock, or you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of rock, and they got like twenty years. What makes a guy think that he can go from writing and being incarcerated to making a movie? Like, you did you you didn't have a camera, did you? I'm not in pr- pr- prison. No, I mean, no, no. When you came out, when you're doing a white no, boy. No, when, when I when I first when I first got out. So when I first got out, like I I got. You know, because my parents hit me off when I got out. You know, so I got I got like this. I got like a uh, a Apple. You know, I got I got like a. a you know, a MacBook, but I got like the super one for editing, mm-hmm. you know, and then, then I got, I got like a Canon, you know, like, uh, I don't know, what's it like the 5D, you know, Mark 5D, I don't know whatever it's called, but it, the, like the, the low end cinema Canon. And I, I was going to do everything myself. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I was doing like little stuff. I was filming stuff and I was trying to edit, but you know, that shit was hard, man. You, you know, you got to spend a lot of time to learn to do that shit. And, uh, you know, even like the camera stuff I was learning, but you know, and but I was still writing. I was making my money writing as a journalist. Incredible movie, and it's a documentary. It ends up on Netflix, right? Becomes this really big hit. It ended up on Stars. Yeah. Um, how did that change your life when that documentary came out? Well, really, when it first went in Stars and it first came out, um, it didn't really jump. I mean, it was out, mm-hmm. you know, and we did help. You know, we, we helped to get Rick out, but, you know, not the movie. I mean, the Hollywood movie, our movie, and, you know, a lot of other people helped, to, activists helped to get Rick out. You know, it was like a big group effort, you yeah. know, and we got him out. But um, it stars, it, it didn't really, it was on stars for like 18 months. But probably because nobody was watching stars until 50 Cent came over there. Probably. Yeah, so, so, so <laughs> it, it didn't really, like, it didn't yeah. go viral or it didn't really, you know, do anything. Like, yeah. I do, I thought that movie, I put like everything into that movie. And I thought that movie was good. I thought it was going to like change my fortunes and put all this wind in my sail. But I don't know, everybody kind of ignored it. Even though we did help get him out, mm-hmm. you know, they seemed like, you know, it didn't really cause any ripples. Mm-hmm. And right at the end of the pandemic, it went on Netflix. Mm. Right? And, and like how I look at it now, it was like uh, it was like the Tiger King effect. Mm. You know that when Tiger King did in the middle of the pandemic, Tiger King blew up on mm-hmm. Netflix because everybody's staying home. Yep. So we benefited from that Tiger King effect. It went on Netflix. It was like top ten for like the first two weeks. You know, not top ten documentaries, like top ten everything for like two weeks. You know, and it, I don't know how many, you know, some people say I got like 20 million views in a couple months. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Netflix releases that information or where they got, you know, but I've heard that number thrown around. It got like 20 million views in the first couple months it was on Netflix. So um, that's when shit changed for me, mm-hmm. you know, because now 
I'm writer producer of a fucking top ten Netflix Netflix hit. So you know, until then, nothing really changed for me. I had a bunch of ideas, stuff I did. You know, and Sean was doing his thing, and you know, I'm trying to do my stuff, but I'm not really doing much because I, I don't have any money. Nobody's invested in me. I don't really have a track record. And but when that blew up, it put the spotlight on that movie. Then that's when you know investors came, started coming to me, and where they were like, "Well, what do you got?" But it, it took a long time, bro, because you didn't go on Netflix. The movie was almost out like three years before it went on Netflix. Mm. You know, but it was weird because of the pandemic and because it went on Netflix and it's such a big platform. It yeah. was like it was brand new. Yeah. It was like it just came out. Yeah, yeah. So it was really weird because it was like, and I felt like we were going to have that success right off the bat, like one of our stars, but nobody saw it. You know, like you said, nobody was watching stars. So we didn't have that success. So it was kind of a letdown. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm on this big, you know, I'm on this big project that costs a lot of money. I'm writer, producer, and then it was like, boom, nothing happened. So it was almost like, like a delayed gratification. But then, you know, like you look at stuff too, like in retrospect, like maybe it didn't hit that time because, you know, maybe I wasn't ready at that time. You know, the movie wasn't ready. Everybody involved wasn't ready. But I, I think also it's because during the pandemic when everything slowed down and, and, and uh, you know, people started looking at the police, police brutality and, and the Black Lives Movement, you know, kind of came to the forefront, you know, with the, with the George Floyd stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it made a lot of people think, and it made a lot of people think, like, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of corruption in law enforcement. So I think when we first put the movie out before the pandemic, it's the hustle and bustle, you know, the capitalism, everybody's moving. Nobody thinks that that shit happened. You know, oh, yeah, we're saying that happened, but they're like, oh, this is America, that shit doesn't happen. But then after the pandemic and Trump being president, you know, so much stuff was, like, exposed where – now we it's on Netflix and, and people have had a little break and had time to think and, and get away from the, the rat race. The people are ready to go down these rabbit holes that we're showing in this movie. They're ready to believe this stuff. Yeah. So it's it's all it's like life. It's all timing, man. So, you know, yeah. but yeah, I, I yeah, because I've been on a wave, you know, since that movie went on, you know, I've been on a wave like I got uh, I got eight projects in production right now with Outlaw Films. Mm. You know, that's my studio. Yeah. Um, I got two ready that, you know, are, are going to come out, you know, probably uh, this spring. And White Boy is going to, I think it might be coming back to Netflix. It's going back on Netflix, February, okay, so February 15th. It's go going back. Go check that out February 15th. I don't know when this video is going to come out. It might come out after that. Go check out White Boy. It's a great documentary. But talk to me about this project. I don't know if I can even talk about this. Dope Men, the first drug cartel. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So I got this film. Um, I got two films ready right now. One's called Nightlife, which I, I won a bunch of awards at, at film festivals. That's about this dude. He's a violence interrupter who walks the streets of uh, St. Louis, like in the worst areas on the north side, like 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. He's basically trying to keep all, all the young guys, you know, it's like gang pure violence out of New yeah, York. Okay. From killing each other. Yeah. You know, but um, he calls it a ministry of presence. So that's one. I filmed him, followed him for two years. Dope men. Dopeman is about um, America's first drug cartel, you know, because we like to talk about, we like to talk, see, this is, this is the, the whole thing, like what white America does, right? Mm-hmm. White America, they, you know, like for the drug cartel, they want to talk about like the Colombians or the Mexicans, like they invented these cartels. Yeah. yeah. No, dude, the, the Italian mafia was the first drug cartel. They've been the big, most longest running drug cartel. They started in the 20s before prohibition ended because you know it, it's all these famous mobsters like the people know like Lucky Luciano you know what I'm saying Arnold Rothstein you know Meyer Lansky you know Jack Legs Diamond you know all these dudes that have gone down in gangster lore you know as gangsters really these dudes were, were drug dealers because in pro- prohibition you know they were pushing the alcohol but they knew that prohibition was going to end so before prohibition ended they were already looking you know because prohibition these dudes before pro before prohibition, these gangsters were just like corner thugs, bro. They didn't have no organization because they right. didn't have no money, right? They were just like thugs, you know, like ro- like regulating the local neighborhood. But then prohibition gave them money and made them the international players, and they started developing all the international trade routes that would eventually be used for drugs, you know, because they were bringing in alcohol from Europe, Canada. So you know, they developed all this stuff, and so. You know, they were looking for what can we replace this money with, you know, because once they got money, they got the power. They had the politicians in their pocket. They can do whatever the fuck they want. So they wanted to keep the money going. So that's when they started bringing in heroin, you know, Lucky Luciano, Arnold Rothstein, you know, and 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 really the 
you know, in my opinion, I mean, some people might argue with me, but in my opinion, heroin is what made the the mafia into the power, you know, that they were, you know, for 40, 50 years. I mean, I think probably the 80s and 90s, their their, their power kind of went down. But, you know, at one time, dude, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, dude, the fucking mafia was one of the most powerful fucking organizations in the United States, if not the world. Mm-hmm. You know, they had the politicians, they had everybody, you know. The, you know, all the labor unions, you know, the rackets, you know, they controlled everything, dude. I mean, look, they had to go to Lucky Luciano in World War II to control, because Lucky Luciano controlled the docks. So in World War II, when they when the U.S. military wanted to do stuff, they had to go to Lucky Luciano to, to for the docks, man. Mm. That's how much power they, the military's like, you know, they let, Lucky Luciano was in prison. They let him out because he fucking gave him access to the docks. Wow. You know what I'm saying? But, so that's what this movie is about. It, it, it shows, you know, how all these, you know, mythical gangsters of, you know, mafia lore, you know, form this drug cartel but what it also shows is people like to say, like, Richard Nixon, you know, started the drug war, like, in, in the 1970s. That's, like, this common misconception. No, nah, bro. They formed the Bureau of Narcotics, which is the predecessor to the DEA. They formed that before Prohibition even ended because there were all these failed Prohibition agents that they didn't have a future because mm-hmm. that's what they did. They chased bad guys for alcohol. Prohibition's in it. They don't have a job no more. So now alcohol is now legal, and these guys that was meant to go out there and enforce during Prohibition, they don't have a job. So they needed to create another war in order yeah. to keep these men employed. Is that what I'm just yeah. saying? Yeah, so, okay. so, so, so really everything, like it's, it's weird when you look at it. There's this dude named Harry Anslinger. He was like the dude, the Bureau of Narcotics. He was like the, the uh, you know, like the head, you know, top narcotics dude, right? And, and all these things that he formed, like, in the late 20s and 30s are, like, still practiced today, dude. Look, this dude was racist, mm-hmm. right? This is a dude, uh, you know, the jazz singer, Billie Holiday. There's a movie about it. I saw the movie. There's a movie. This dude was chasing Billie Holiday, bro. Mm-hmm. She was a drug addict. And mm-hmm. this dude was hounding her, trying to bust her. Mm-hmm. This dude, fucking Harry Anslinger, because he was so That's racist. That's where I know the name from. Yeah. yeah it, it, and look, he hated Italians. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was after all the Italians, you know, and and so all these racist drug war views were this dude is the one that started it all. Right. So when I look at it, right, I see like it's this hundred year battle that started like, you know, in the 20s, 1930s when they formed the Bureau of Narcotics. So you got, you know, you got the cops here and you got the dope men here. You know, even though the dope men have changed, the dope men have changed from Italians, you know, to to Colombians, to Mexicans, even like in the African-American communities, like yeah. in the 70s, you had all the big heroin guys like Nicky Barnes, you know, Frank Lucas, you know. So you have all these different dope men. The dope men have always changed, but the government people have always stayed the same. You know, they changed, but it's always been like the Bureau of Narcotics, and then they changed, you know, to the DEA. So really, this drug war, dude, has been going on forever. And when you look at, at the root of it, it goes all the way back to like 1920s. The drug war is racist, right? It's it, it's about money and control, you know. And it, it, so it's just been going on. It's like this hundred year battle. So that's what that's what this first dope man. It's the dope this. I want to do dope man like like I want to keep it going on as a series. So this is basically like the volume one. Like this is how it starts. All right, I can appreciate you putting the focus on where you say um, the uh, the first kind of cartels were that they, that they don't look like black and brown people that you know it's something that maybe black and brown people have uh, benefited from a, a lot of them going to jail or being killed behind it as well but it didn't start with the black and brown people is i think the point that you're making and i can appreciate you saying that um no dude look if you look dude look i'm telling you this stuff is so it's so thought out right on 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 like on the government side cuz look dude if you look look at old pictures of black people dude like from the 50s even into the 60s look how they dressed right it wasn't to the 70s dude when they pumped all the heroin they pumped all the heroin into the black communities to destroy them bro Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying the same thing happened in the age with the crack am i right yeah yeah right Right. but look look at old pictures dude from the 50s like look 20s 30s 40s 50s look at black families bro Mm -hmm. look at because look from the South, because the South was racist, you know, because of slavery. So you had all types of, Af- you know, black people, African Americans, coming up to the North to work in the factories. The Great right? Migration. Yeah, but look, as so- and they moved in all the cities. As soon as they all moved in the cities, 
Where did the factories go, bro? The factories moved out to the mm. suburbs. Mm. So everybody, you know, all black people are moving up for these jobs, and then all of a sudden the jobs disappear. Mm -hmm. And they start pumping in heroin in. Mm. So the war on, not only is the introduction of drugs in the United States society um, largely can be explained through systematic racism, but also the punishments that have been handed down to people over the past, let's say, 30 years is a direct result of systemic racism as well yeah. in the criminal justice system. Yeah. And even Harry Anslinger, right? Harry Anslinger, like like what they used to call back there, like, uh, you know, because all the Irish and Italians were coming in, and they, they weren't, Irish and Italians, like back then, weren't considered white, bro. Right, They right. were not considered white. That's facts. White people were wasps. White Anglo Saxon, Saxon Protestant. Protestant. Yeah. So look, Harry Anslinger was white Anglo Saxon Protestant. He didn't bust. There was plenty of white Anglo Saxon Protestant drug dealers. Mm -hmm. He didn't bust them. Mm -hmm. He busted the Italian, the Irish, and the Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then as the Italian, Irish, and Jewish assimilated, because you know the Italian at one point, like around 1930, probably you know that's when Lucky Luciano, you know went to all Italians. So look, they probably had meetings. I mean, I, I don't know, I wasn't there. But look, it's weird, because if you look from the 20s into the 30s, so then all the Irish and Jewish gangsters kind of disappear like behind the scenes. So look, mm -hmm. the Jewish go into banking. The Irish go into politics and law enforcement. And the Italians keep the organized crime. So dude, you cannot tell me that all those smart dudes back in the 20s, like Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, you know, in the eye and the Irish, like they didn't plan this. Like they didn't have a meeting and say, okay, look, we're gonna keep this Italian, Irish, you guys are the whitest, so you guys move in, you know, to, to law enforcement and politicians. Mm -hmm. yep. So then, now they gotta find a new enemy. Who's a new enemy? People of color. Who, who are we gonna blame it on now? You know, the, all these other groups assimilated to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So it's just crazy when you look at it. And you can't tell me on the criminal side or on the government side that they didn't know all this and they didn't talk about it and they didn't make plans. It's all, you know, like you said, it's systematic. It's all systematic, dude. What was uh, what's some of the best weed you ever smoked? Um, I, 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 I like Humboldt, bro. I'm an I'm a, I'm a Emerald Triangle guy, you know, Northern California. Yeah, so yeah. I, I smoke Humboldt, bud. You know, I like I like Humboldt. I mean, it doesn't. I think the the greenhouse mm -hmm. or the outdoor from Humboldt County is better than a lot of the indoor. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I like I like stuff grown organic. You know, like like at natural. I don't like like a lot of indoor operations. It's like hydro, and they use salt and chemicals. You know. Um, so I, I always, I always like back in the day, like on Dead Tour, we we'd be like, "Yo, man, is it is it fucking, is it OG?" Like if somebody had weed, we'd be like, "Is it OG or is it Kimmy?" Because mm. Kimmy means like it's made with chemicals. OG means like it's grown organically. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear a lot of people like they say for weed, like what OG. Some people say OG means ocean grown. You know what I'm saying? Or some people don't even know. But like how O, like a lot of weed has that OG. Some mm -hmm. people like it's original. It's not original gangster. Yeah. So some people say it means ocean grown, but to me it always mean like it was grown organic. Mm. You know, OG organic. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, so yeah. So I, I I I'm a I'm a Humboldt County dude. So you know. Somebody gave me something a long time ago, like maybe 15, 20 years ago. It was called G13. They said it was government. You ever heard of that? Like mm. government grade. Mm. It, it was. He gave me so. It was only this much of it, and and then gone for like a yeah. few hours. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? But to ask somebody about G thirteen if it's yeah. still out there. But there's, there's a lot of good weed. I mean, weeds. Are, I, I don't. I mean, I, I prefer like I say. I don't. I don't like that shit that puts you in the couch. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I yeah, mean, yeah. it looks pretty, it smells nice, but you know, I, I like I like that su super terpy, you know, greenhouse. Like they call it the entourage effect. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. That's like that, that's what I get from the, the Humboldt County stuff. Is it good to smoke so much good stuff, or should we be smoking more trash? I had a conversation with somebody last week, and they said, you know, and I always kind of thought this, like, if you always smoking the good stuff, then you always need to get better and better stuff is more expensive mm -hmm. in order to get you to where you need to get. If you may be messing around with a little bit of trash. Or you could just dab. Oh, okay. Just dab. See, I keep I, people talk about dab all the time, and I confess I don't know anything yeah. about. No, it. I like I like hash rosin. Hash rosin is nice, but um, yeah, I don't I, I don't know. I, I like I said I, I prefer like I prefer like a good uh you know like nice weed, but I don't I don't need like that thirty percent THC. That shit. Right. Know, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather smoke like the twenty percent THC that's like super terpy. You know, has that really good taste. I'm a sativa guy anyhow. I like like some nice sour diesels, blue dream shit like that. 
let me ask you this. If there's a lesson to be learned from the story that is your life, what would that lesson be? Um, I would say, you know, don't give up. Be relentless, man. Don't let people pigeonhole you. You know, a lot of times in life, you know, it's, it, it could be our family members. It could be our parents. It could be our relatives. It could be schools. Like they tell you just because who you are or where you're from or what happened to you or what color you are or how you dress, people say, oh, you can't do this. You can't do in, in prison, man, they told me, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't be a writer. The cops told me and the prisoners told me. They're like, you can't do this. But I always did. You know, I was like, no, I can do this. So I think if you believe in something and you want to do something, just persevere, man, because you can do it. You know, maybe, you know, maybe like, like I'm 52, so, you know, I, I can't be unreasonable and be like, oh, I'm going to go be an NBA player. You know, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as long as you have realistic goals, you can achieve them. You just have to put the work and the effort in. And so many people get discouraged, man. Think, I mean, everybody knows people like they try something once or twice and it doesn't work or they try something for six months and it doesn't work. No, man, you got to do it. If you want to do something, man, do it for three to five years. Give yourself a chance to learn whatever you're doing, to learn your craft, to build your business, to build your reputation, to build your skills. I believe, you know, to a certain extent, people can do whatever they want to do if you put the time in. Mm -hmm. You know, but you got to want it. You got to grab it. You got to get it. Nobody's going to give you nothing. Nobody's going to put you on. You got to put yourself on. You know what I'm saying? So my, my biggest, like, I don't think I'm the best writer. I don't think I'm the best filmmaker. I don't think I'm the best anything. But you know what I'm the best at? I'm the best at being relentless. I don't give up. Right? If I try, if I try this door and this door's closed, I'm going to try 19 other doors. I'm going to try 20 different angles to try to get where I'm trying to go. So that, that's, that's, that's my best advice to anybody, man. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do nothing. And be relentless in, in, in you know, achieving and, and going about to gaining your goals. You moved LSD before. You ever did LSD? Yeah, I do LSD all the time. Oh, still now? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first time you did it, what was that like? Um, I've never done it. I don't even know. I, can't, I don't even know if I can remember the first time. Uh, yeah, I tripped so much, man. I tripped. I you know, is that what it does? You don't remember what's going on when you do LSD? I, I don't know. I mean, my, my teenage years, dude, I did a lot of drugs, so, you know, shit's kind of hazy. But, uh... I, I really, I cannot pinpoint the first time. I, I don't remember the first time I did LSD. Yeah. I mean, what do you do when you do, do you lay down? Do you, no, you need, you do you need friends out. with you? I mean, you know, I, I, I would, like, a lot of times I, w I would go to concerts, you know, like on Grateful Dead tour, you know, you go listen to the music, like jam bands. Um, I mean, I wouldn't trip on ass and go to like a Metallica concert per se, you know, but to go to like a Grateful De Dead or festival like that with jam bands, that's cool. But um, I like to go out in nature you know, like camping, you know, hiking, you know, go out to lakes. Um, but really my, my favorite thing, like I, I just like, I like to trip, man, trip with my girl, man. You know what I'm saying? Just like hang out with my girl and trip, you know? I, like I say, I, uh, I, 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 I went with my girl to like, like Disneyland uh, last summer. And um, yeah, we were tripping at Disneyland with her kids. <laughs> Uh, mm. I, I mean, I, um, but you know when I like to trip too. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a very yeah. experienced tripper, so like I don't take like one hit, dude. I like to take, you know, one hit is usually like a hundred mics. You know, I like, I like to take like at least two hundred fifty mics. You know, yeah. So I like to take at least three hits, and I, I prefer, I prefer liquid. I don't, I'll take the blotter, but you know, I, I prefer the liquid. It's just you know, I like to get my brain. Like I say, I like, I want my brain to be on fire. You know what I'm saying? I don't. Like when I trip, I want my brain to be on fire. No, it's it's like stimulating, dude. To me, it's like uh, to me, it's like a reset, bro. Because like think in life, right? You got most people. We got blinders on, trying to get what we want, or or you know, we're just we're doing what we do. We stay in our lane. We got blinders on. So when you take LSD, bro, it like takes those blinders off, bro, and you can like reset your brain. You can like recalibrate. You know, but obviously, like, I'm not going to, I wouldn't tell you, like, go take fucking three hits of fucking acid for your first time. Yeah, but dude, take, take like half a hit, man. Take like 20, take like a quarter hit, take like half a hit, take like 25. Most hits are like 100 mics. So take like 25, 50 mics. Take a quarter hit, take a half hit, see how you feel. Or take some mushrooms, because mushrooms are, are a little bit more mild than LSD. You know, unless you take a lot. You know, if you eat about five grams of mushrooms, you're probably going to trip pretty hard. <laughs> And um, what advice, finally, what advice would you give to somebody uh, who is on the run? 
Oh, nowadays, man, shit, just hide. Because <laughs> nowadays you got so many cameras and everything. Look, no social media, no cell phone. Get a burner phone. You know, turn that GPS off. You know what I'm saying? And and don't talk to anybody that you knew before. Okay. You know, or hide. I mean, if I went on the run right now, I mean, I, I would try to go up in the mountains somewhere and just hide out. Okay. Arthur, activist, producer, writer, entrepreneur, filmmaker, Seth Ferranti, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that. What the fuck was poppin' is your boy Mike with I was like, uh, 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 uh.